All right, when we ended last week, we just looked at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 35, the last part of that chapter, which warns of the dangers of adultery. And that same theme, it sounded again in chapter 7 that we're going to pick up with. And this emphasis on, on sexual temptation. You see, especially for young men, it's unmistakable how this is being emphasized. And there is a reason for that. In chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1 to 27, he says, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house, I've looked out through my lattice, and I've seen among the simple, I've perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices and today I've paid my vows. So now I've come out to meet you and to seek you eagerly and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me, and be attentive to, my word, to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many a victim has she laid low. And all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Now this teaching, which as I indicated, it addresses the same subject as we saw at the end of chapter 6. It begins with this familiar appeal to take his instruction to heart. To become intimately associated with woman wisdom. And the purpose of the appeal that is stated in verse 5, is to keep the son from the forbidden woman, to keep him from the adulteress with her smooth words. And in verses 6 through 9, the father tells the son a story about what he's seen happen to others. He's witnessed through his window. He's watched a naive young man walking at dusk down a street where a married woman resided, a woman who was looking for an illicit sexual relationship. He was watching and he saw this happen. And in verses 10 to 13, the woman who's dressed provocatively, that's what she's dressed like a prostitute, she's dressed in a way saying, I'm sexually interested, sending that signal, not modestly, but she's dressed provocatively and she appears uh, she appears and she aggressively comes on is how we would say it she aggressively comes on to the young man and she's described as wily of heart she's wily of heart because she's scheming she's seeking to lure this man into a sexual relationship so this is what she's up to She's a woman who's on the prowl. She's not content with her life at home. That's this thing you see here, that every corner she lies in wait. She's in the market. She's in the street. She's unhappy. She's not content. She's on the prowl. And she's going about. 
interested in luring people into a sexual relationship. And she kisses this fellow. She kisses him and then she flat out propositions him. Just flat out propositions him. She tells him in verses 14 and 15 that she came out to meet him because she just offered fellowship or peace offerings and completed her vows. Now some scholars think that this is a reference to the woman's participation in a pagan religion that involved ritual sex. But I'm with those who think it's much more likely that what the woman is doing is she's enticing the man not only with sex but with a scrumptious meal. See, this is part, this is part, of, her, part of her lure. Most of the meat of a fellowship or a peace offering it was available to be eaten by the worshipers. And it was to be eaten on that same day, on the day of the sacrifice. You can see that in Leviticus chapter 3 and Leviticus chapter 7. So what you have here, I think, is that she's pulling out all the stops. She's stopping at nothing. She's luring this man with meat, which was not something, you, know, you and I, we eat meat all the time. But that was something special. She's got something really scrumptious meal here that's ready. That's part of the lure. Not only is there sex. Tremper Longman says she not only is engaging in illicit sex. But she's also blaspheming the holy things of God. She, she, she's taking a sacrificial offering. And she's using it as bait for sexual immorality. That's, that's what this woman is doing and what she's up to. And then in verses 16 to 20, she tells the young man that her place is all fixed up, you see, in a sensually pleasing way. It's not going to be funky and all this kind of... It's all decked out with coverings, colored linens, Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Very sensual. Very pleasing. My place is just right for a night of romance. You see, she's after this dude hard, pressing this young man hard. And then she, so she tells him she's fixed up her place in this sensually pleasing way. And then she explicitly invites him for a night of lovemaking while her husband's out of town on a business trip. He's gone. He took money. Not going to be back till the full moon. So you don't have to worry about him coming in. So come on, man. You know, come on. And so this is what's happening. And I'm telling you, this is, this, well, I'll just let the, the wise man speak. But young people, you, got, you have to be on guard. Because this is powerful, powerful stuff. In verse 21 to 23, she pours on the seductive talk and the flattery. I've told you, men's egos are vulnerable to this. Well, oh, you know, oh, you're, you're so, so wonderful. You see, you're so wonderful. That's part of the hook. I got food. I've got the offer of sex. I've got flattery saying, you're like just, oh, you're, wow, you're so wonderful. And guys just gobble it up. They gobble it up. And so this is what she's doing. She's pouring that on. And the young man chooses to follow her. And in so doing, he's like various animals that walk into deadly situations without appreciating the consequences. He's just like that. This is, he says all at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he doesn't know that it will cost him his life. So here she is out kissing him, propositioning him, telling him we could have a night of love making, won't get caught, husband's gone, got the place all ready, got the meal ready. And this guy... All right, I'm in. <laughs> he says, I'm in. How many people have said that? How many people have said that and ignored what the wise man is saying? And so in doing that, walking into this trap, walking into this trap without appreciating its consequences, verses 24 to 27, the father warns his sons not to repeat that young man's mistake. He tells him to stay away from such women. Stay away from such women. Her invitation, it sparkles with fantasies of pleasure, but she is a death trap. 
I know what it looks like. I'm not stupid. I know how it glitters. I know how tempting it is. That's why I keep telling you. You have to stay away from that. Because she is a death trap. Chapter 8, we get wisdom's autobiography. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call. And my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things. And from my lips will come what is right. From my mouth, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There's nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule and nobles all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. <clears throat> verses, verses 1 through 3, we have an unidentified speaker, perhaps the father who's been instructing his sons. He makes clear by means of rhetorical questions that wisdom, also called understanding, is crying out. She stands at the highest point beside the path, which means that she can be heard by passers-by. So she's standing at this highest point beside the path, over everybody so she can be heard. She stands there. She stands at the crossroads. That's where many people travel. She shouts at the gates, the entrances to the city. So do you get the picture that she wants to be heard? She wants to reach people. 
That's what she's doing. Woman wisdom speech, it begins in in verse 4. And she says in verses 4 and 5 that she's crying out to people. She's urging the simple ones to learn prudence. This is what she wants. She wants the simple ones to learn prudence and the fools to learn sense. Now clearly fools here, fools in this case, doesn't refer to those who are hardened. It's not, they're not here to be equated with mockers. See, these fools are paralleled with the simple. Those who are naive and immature, but who are at least open to responding to the message. So she's appealing to them. She's appealing to the immature. She's appealing to the naive. And she wants to bestow on them what she has to offer to enlighten them, to give them wisdom. And in verses 6 through 9, wisdom declares that her speech, it is noble, it is right, it is truthful, it is righteous and straight. And that there's nothing wicked, twisted, or crooked in what she says. She's just giving you truth and righteousness and straight speech. There's nothing conniving or wrong or sneaky or off about what she's saying. One can trust completely what woman wisdom says. And verses 10 to 11 says that wisdom and her associates, discipline and knowledge, they're to be preferred over precious metals and jewels. She's that important, that significant. You've seen this before. And I just wonder, do we actually think that? Do we really believe that pursuing and obtaining divine wisdom in live that it's really valuable or do we think that we're it's okay we'll just kind of pick up what we need from culture or do we really need do we value divine wisdom that's the question verse 12 begins wisdom's autobiography proper she indicates there that she's characterized by prudence knowledge and discretion These qualities are bound up with her. Prudence, knowledge, discretion, all bound up with woman wisdom. In verse 13, the fear of the Lord is equated with hating evil. You see, those who are submitted to God, they hate what he hates. Fear of the Lord is equated with hating evil. Well, how is that? Because those who are submitted to God hate what he hates, and he hates evil. And what he hates, it includes pride, arrogance, evil ways, and perverted speech. You say, well, how do you know God hates those things? Because wisdom says she hates them, and she is a personification of God's wisdom. So this he says, look, fear of the Lord... He equates this with hatred of evil. And then woman wisdom says, I hate pride and arrogance and evil ways and perverted speech. So fear of the Lord is hatred of those things because she is the personification of God's wisdom. When she says, I hate these things, God hates these things. And so that's what's being said. God hates those. Verse 14 Verse 14 associates counsel, or we might say advice. It associates counsel and sound wisdom and insight and strength. Associates all of those things with wisdom. Now those qualities that are associated with wisdom, they obviously are valuable in navigating life. They're valuable in living and in navigating life. And so they're very desirable. And the point is that if readers want them, they have to obtain wisdom. If you want these things that are associated with wisdom, if you recognize that these things are valuable for navigating life, then you must obtain wisdom. She is a jewel. You must pursue her and you must obtain her. Verses 15 and 16. They say that wisdom... That wisdom is the means by which kings and princes rule well. 
She is the means by which kings and princes rule with justice and righteousness. And the classic illustration is Solomon's handling of the two women who claim to be the mother of the same baby in 1 Kings chapter 3. You know the story, right? Who comes over and said, no, uh, her baby died. This is my baby. No, 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 that, that's my baby. It was her baby who died. And so no witnesses, what do you do? And Solomon, in his wisdom, he said, okay, here's what we'll do. You just cut the baby in half. You give half to one, half to the other. Well, the mother said, no, you give it to her. The one who was not the mother said, fine with me, cut him in half. Solomon said, give it to the one who didn't want him cut in half. That's the real mother. You see, this is the idea of how wisdom is necessary for wise, for just and righteous ruling. And so that's what you see there. That's what, that's what that reference is. Verse 17 says, wisdom can be found by those, those who will seek her diligently. You see this again, actively pursue her and you will find her. God will give you wisdom, but he will not give it to you if you refuse to pursue her. As though you sit there and say, listen, no, I got a better idea, God. Here's how it's going to be. I'm going to sit here and insist that you give me wisdom and I'm not going to lift a finger. I'm not going to think, pray, read, talk, seek, anything. You just do it my way. That's not going to happen. You see, that's not going to happen. Wisdom has, is something that has to be pursued. Verses 18 to 21 speak again of the rewards that accompany a relationship with wisdom. See, the wise are blessed with wealth and honor and righteousness. The consequences of being wise. See, the fruit of woman wisdom is better than gold and silver. So these, these things are associated with with gaining wisdom. And in verse 22 to 31, wisdom emphasizes that she was brought into existence before the creation of the world. She was brought into existence. We've seen this before. But here you have the fullest statement of it, that she's brought into existence before the creation of the world. She witnessed and she participated in creation as suggested by her reference, uh, the reference to her in verse 30, as a craftsman or a master workman. So she was there and she was involved and in participating in creation. Yahweh created the world through wisdom. As I said before, it's not an accident, you see. The world of God is an expression of His wisdom and planning and all of that. And so she was there and was at work and he created the world through her. Tremper Longman says, <clears throat> if one wants to know how the world works and therefore how to navigate life with its problems and pitfalls, then wisdom is the one to get to know. Who would know better how to act in the world than the one through whom it was made? That's the, see, that's the point, see, of wisdom associating herself and, and saying, I'm here and I'm used at creation, so wisdom is skillful living. If you want to know how to navigate the created world, you can do no better than coming to me. You see, because I am God's wisdom. And I was there when the world was created. Now, if woman wisdom is a personification of God's wisdom, the question is, how can she be said to have been created? See, that's kind of puzzling, right? I mean, if woman wisdom is God, personification of God's wisdom, then in what sense can we say that she was created? Because God is always wise and he's eternal. You see, well, I've suggested to you before that woman wisdom is a personification of God's wisdom after God purposed aspects of that wisdom for human perception and discovery. In other words, the way I see woman wisdom is that she's a personification of divine wisdom in both its communicable, meaning those elements that can be perceived and discovered by man, and its non-communicable elements, those that cannot be perceived by man. So God s created a subset or distinguished aspects of his wisdom and set them apart for human discovery. 
And so, see, what I think is going on here is that this divine purposing of aspects of his wisdom for human discovery prior to creation that's alluded to poetically as woman wisdom's creation. Okay, that's what I think is going on there. Because clearly we see who woman wisdom is and this idea of her creation, I think it's a poetic way of saying that God distinguished aspects of his wisdom prior to creation, some aspects to be accessible to mankind. Not all of God's wisdom is accessible to us, despite what you may think. So I think that's, I think that's what is going on there. 32 to 36, wisdom urges the young men to heed her words. The result of doing that will be life and God's favor, whereas the result of rejecting her words will be harm and death. Now understand too, this will, we'll see this get more intense as we get to chapter 9, but what this is, this is all an intro and, and a, not, I mean there, there's obviously wisdom being conveyed here in these first nine chapters, but so much of it is to get us to make a decision as we launch into chapters 10 to 31, will we pursue wisdom or will we not? Because we're going to be given a great deal of wisdom in these classical proverbs. Will we absorb them? Will we change? Will we benefit from them? Or will we, will we be closed to them? That's the idea. Now we get this ultimate encounter <clears throat> Here in chapter 9, between woman wisdom and woman folly. Chapter 9, verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in, in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman folly is loud. She's seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. What we have here, woman wisdom has built a mansion. This is hewn with seven pillars. She has built a mansion that's indicative of her wealth and social status. See, this is a poetical way of expressing woman wisdom's importance. That you look at this. She's built her house. It's hewn with seven pillars. She's got this massive structure that indicates her importance. And in verses 2 and 3, she's prepared a luxurious feast. This great feast she's made ready, and she's issued invitations by sending out her servant girls and by calling herself from the top of the heights of the city. The English Standard Version is almost alone, in fact, in indicating that it was the young women who do the calling out. Uh, she sends out the young women. Most translations would say she sent, she sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. But either way, she's got this, uh, she's created this luxurious feast and she's issued invitations to people. And in verses 4 through 6, wisdom appeals to the simple. 
She appeals to the naive, to the immature. She's calling out to them. She appeals to them to accept her invitation. Longman says in, in the ancient Near East, for a woman to invite a man to a meal has erotic overtones. What woman wisdom wants is an intimate relationship with the man. You see, woman wisdom is calling so that we will get to know her. That we will take her in deeply. This is what she wants so that we'll be blessed in that, blessed by that. Now, you get in the first six verses, verses 1 to 6 and verses 13 to 18, these are clearly parallel appeals. By woman wisdom and woman folly. 1 to 6, woman wisdom has her appeal. 13 to 18, woman folly has her appeal. But how the, the intervening verses, how verses 7 and 12 relate to either of those isn't really clear. You see here we have in verses 7 to 12. So 1 to 6, woman wisdom's appeal. 13 to 18, you get this very counter appeal from woman folly. And then we have in the middle 7 to 12 that's not really clear how to how does 7 and 12 relate to either one of those. And perhaps verses 7 and 12 are best seen as a, as a kind of parenthetical comment by woman wisdom. You see, look at it this way, as a kind of parenthetical comment by woman wisdom that's designed to enhance the invitation that she's making to the simple in verses 4 and 6. The contrast between the wise slash righteous and the mockers slash wicked or scoffers slash wicked. The contrast you see between those two in verses 7 to 9 suggests that the simple people, woman wisdom is inviting to learn from her that they have more in common with the wise than with the mockers. You see, mockers are to be left alone. They're to be left alone because they won't receive correction or instruction. They're a lost cause. You don't spend your time with them because if you try to correct them, what do they do? You get abuse. He who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. You see, so the very fact that woman wisdom is appealing to the simple is saying implicitly that she views them more like the righteous than she does like the mockers. They are more in that camp than they are in the hardcore hater camp. And so I think this may be what's going on here in this text, you see. Woman wisdom's appealing to the simple. And this, her, her doing that, it implies that they share with the wise this potential for growth. Otherwise, she wouldn't be engaging them. She wouldn't be appealing to them. And her, her implicit association of the naive with the wise and her distinguishing of the naive from the outright hostile, from the mockers, that may be designed to make it easier for the simple to accept her invitation. In other words, by letting them know that I see you more like these people than like these people, well, that thou make, makes it easier. So she's doing all she can to bring them to listen to her and embrace her and come to know her. She wants them to come in. She wants to teach them. She wants to bless them. But she's not compelling them. She's appealing to them. And that's how life is being appealed to, but you can resist and you can reject it. See, in, in verse 10, in verse 10, <clears throat> woman wisdom announces the prerequisite for accepting her invitation. That prerequisite is the fear of Yahweh. And as I said, with regard to chapter 1, verse 7, submission to the Lord's authority, that is foundational to acquiring wisdom. And she adds that knowing God... Knowing God and His ways, well, that's the definition of insight, real wisdom, which is what she represents. So here she is appealing to them, calling people to come in, and she being the personification of God's wisdom, she will provide a long life 
and that she's going to direct people down the right paths. You see, paths that will avoid a fool's fate. You see, so she says, I will give you long life because when you live in accordance with my precepts and my teaching and you internalize these things, you will not be taking the fool's path and all the ways that exist there for a person's life to be cut down short. And whether a person chooses wisdom or mockery, that person is the primary and ultimate recipient of the consequences. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. You see, so that's what I think is going on. Now we get Folly's invitation. Woman Folly here, loud. You see, so we had, first we had woman wisdom, 1 to 6, 7 to 12. I told you what I think is going on there, but not really clear how that relates to either of these. But clearly 1 to 6 and 13 to 18 are parallel. One is woman wisdom's appeal. The other is woman folly's appeal. And woman folly, she's loud and she's attention getting. She's loud and attention getting, but she's full of, of simpleness, as the English Standard Version footnote says. She's full of simpleness and knows nothing. She's certainly not one. Certainly not one from whom advice should be taken. You see, she's contrasted to woman wisdom. She sits at the doorway of her house. The doorway of her house on a seat at the highest place of the city. And unlike wisdom's luxurious house, hewn with seven pillars, her house isn't described. Nothing is said about woman Folly's house and the reference to the highest place in the city. That's the place where a temple would be built. So that reference to the highest place in the city, that may suggest that she stands for the false gods that vie for Israel's allegiance. But here is, here is woman Folly. There without, without the description of the home, standing at this high place. And she's calling the simple. She's calling the immature, the same group to whom woman wisdom is appealing. So do you see the thing? Here, here, here you are going down the road. I got woman wisdom. I got woman folly. Right as we get ready to go into the rest of the of, uh, Proverbs. I've got woman wisdom and I've got woman folly. They're both appealing to the young, naive, the immature. Come in. Come to me. Join me. Learn of me. Other ones saying the same thing. Choose me, choose me, come over here, come over here. This is the way to go, the way to go. And so a decision has to be made. A choice has to be made. They're, she's appealing to the same one. You see, they're rivals for the same young men. And her appeal is calls for a decision on the part of the reader or the part of the one who hears this. It calls for a decision. Embrace Woman wisdom, through heeding the teaching of Proverbs, or cast your lot with woman folly and turn a deaf ear to their teachings. What's it going to be? Are you really going to hear? Are you really going to learn? Are you really going to benefit? Are you really going to internalize? Are you going to change and be blessed by woman wisdom? as her wisdom is conveyed throughout Proverbs? Or are you just going to go, pff, 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 pff. that's the choice that is starkly being put right as we launch into that. See, in contrast to the, the sumptuous feast offered by woman wisdom when she's inviting the young men, woman folly, she seeks to entice the simple with the, with the excitement of forbidden fruit. That's her ploy. You see, the excitement of forbidden fruit that's described as stolen water and bread eaten in secret. You see, that symbolizes illicit pleasures. That's what she's pulling with. That symbolizes illicit pleasures, certainly including the sexuality of another man's wife, the taking of water from another man's cistern. You can look at chapter 5, verse 15. You see, so that's the... No, I, I have over here, do you see? Come over here. Stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. 
And so here it is. These are the vying appeals. Those to whom woman folly appeals, they are unaware. They're unaware of the danger she represents. Her invitation, as you see, it's an invitation to death. Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he who does not know, but he, but he does not know that the dead are there. That her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So it's another one of these lures like a spider web. And so who's it going to, is it going to be woman wisdom or is it going to be woman folly? Now as we embark, starting, we'll start next week on the proverb, the classic proverbs, proverbs in chapter, beginning in chapter 10. Is that second bell? Real quickly, let me just, just tell you what I want to do there. I'm, I'm going to give you a sketch. See, I, I just don't want to just go through all of the proverbs one after another. What I intend to do is I'm going to give you first the sketch of a wise person that I have put together from the various proverbs. And I will give them to you in a certain organized way just because that's how my mind works. So I'm going to give you here a sketch of a wise person that I've gleaned from Proverbs and I will give them to you in some kind of organized fashion that brings out what are the characteristics of a wise person according to Proverbs. I'll go through that. That'll take us a few weeks. And then I want to comment on some miscellaneous Proverbs that didn't fit in with some of these things. And then we'll look at the woman, uh, the, the Proverbs woman in chapter 31. Then we'll go into 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. All of that will be in the room uh, 104 next to the bathroom. Love to see you there. Thanks. <laughs>